one of the most controversial wars ever fought in British history, the two Boer Wars of the late 1800s were a series of conflicts between the expanding British Empire in South Africa and the long-established Dutch settlers of the region, leading to a protracted confrontation that saw both sides exhibit significant fighting skills and qualities, though at the same time many outrages that still resonate today. The man influential behind the Boer Wars was Henry Herbert, the fourth Earl of Carnarvon, and British Secretary of State for the Colonies under Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, who was Premier from 1868 to 1880, the key priority of the British government being the expansion of the British Empire in order to snuff out any potential opposition from other European imperial powers. Lord Carnarvon desired the formation of a confederation of all the British colonies, independent Boer republics, and independent African groups in South Africa under British control, but had realised by 1876 that diplomatic routes to such an accord were not viable, and thus he suggested to Disraeli that a more assertive campaign should be undertaken against the Transvaal Republic, which would subsequently bring the neighbouring Orange Free State into line. Meanwhile, in the Transvaal Republic itself, the nation's president since 1872, T.F. Burgers, led a country rife with financial woes, these being primarily caused by a recently declared war between the Boers and the Pedi, under their leader Sekukune, in the northeastern Transvaal. The opposition to this war, and a heavily corrupt fiscal system, meaning the Boer people often failed to pay their taxes reliably, if at all. Because of the disastrous fiscal policies of Borger's leadership, he was a highly disliked figure in the Republic government, even despite his victory over Sekukune during February 1877, during which the tribal leader had agreed to pay a fine for the destruction caused in the conflict, though by this point no amount of cash injections from the Boers could reverse what had essentially become a bankrupt state. Under the orders of Lord Carnarvon, Sir Theophilus Shepstone, the former Secretary for Native Affairs in Natal, was dispatched to the Transvaal as Special Commissioner, arriving on January 22, 1877, with a contingent of 25 men as support, Shepstone being deliberately vague as to his intentions. While visiting, the British diplomat used his influence to outline the failure of the Transvaal government in ensuring the financial security of the nation, as well as drawing attention to the state's lack of control over the indigenous black population of the Pedi and Zulu, as demonstrated with the recently concluded war with the former throughout the mid-1870s. With Burgers being in no position to negotiate a settlement on advantageous terms, and with the Boer people now firmly turned against his leadership by the machinations of Carnarvon and Shepston, the Republic's leader could do little to stop Britain from taking over the Transvaal, while other figures in his government refused to take the matter seriously. The expectation by Lord Carnarvon was that annexing the Transvaal would be the first step to forming his desired South African Confederation, with English-speaking people in the Republic being positive towards the idea, while the Boers had been completely demoralised by the performance of Borger's government, with Shepston presenting to Carnarvon more than 3,000 signatures from Transvaal citizens who wished to become part of the British Empire. What Shepston had failed to tell his superior was that within the Boer population, there was a huge and extremely vocal opposition to any concept of annexation by the British Empire, wishing instead to retain their independence. Regardless, on April 12, 1877, a proclamation of annexation was read out in Church Square, Pretoria, the capital of the Transvaal Republic, and with no resistance, the Vierkleur flag was taken down and a British Union flag raised in its place. The Transvaal Republic, or Zuid Afrikaanse Republic, being transformed into the British Transvaal colony. However, as had not been noted by Shepstone in his correspondence to Lord Carnarvon, the annexation of the Transvaal was not popular among the Boers, with the Volksrad deciding in May 1877 to send a delegation, consisting of Paul Kruger and E.J.P. Jorison, to England to make sure that the British government was aware of the hostility against British rule in the nation, though the warnings of this delegation were ultimately ignored. In 1878, a petition with more than 6,500 signatures from the Boers was taken to London for presentation to the British government, but Parliament once again refused to relinquish their control over the former Republic. Chepston, now positioned as administrator of the Transvaal colony, and was thus fully attuned, 
to the anger amongst this newly incorporated element of the British colonial population. To try and soothe the mounting aggression, the British made promises to the Boers that would allow them some self-government, but Shepstone was slow to initiate this process, the colonial government failing to address the matter of the Transvaal's economic stagnation, while plans to build a railroad to Delagoa Bay, which could have brought major investment through better transport links with the other South African colonies, was put on hold. Shepstone's inability to calm matters in the Transvaal made him increasingly unpopular within the colonial office in London, one of his biggest failings being his lack of effectiveness when it came to controlling the black population of the colony, as emphasised when his attempts to force Sekukune and the Pedi to pay their outstanding fine to the Transvaal Republic could not be enforced due to an absence of soldiers to force the settlement from the tribal leader. Shepston also failed to control the Zulus on the southeastern border of the colony, and with rising hostilities by the Zulu warriors as a prelude to the Anglo-Zulu War, many farmers were forced to abandon their land to escape the danger. Sir Owen Lanyon eventually replacing Shepston as administrator in 1879, while Sir Garnet Wolseley was appointed High Commissioner of Southeast Africa and Governor of Natal and Transvaal during September of the same year. In an attempt to continue Lord Carnarvon's plans for a South African confederation, war was declared between the British government and the Zulu Kingdom during the same year over matters related to border disputes, the hope being that a quick and easy conquest of the Zulu Kingdom would help galvanise British support in South Africa. Instead, aside from the British suffering a horrendous defeat at the Battle of Island Luana during the opening stages of the war, followed by a protracted campaign that took far longer than expected to overcome the Zulus, the defeat of both the Zulu Kingdom and the Pedi tribe had the effect of increasing opposition to the British rule in the Transvaal by the Boers. In January 1878, a large group of Boers had gathered in Pretoria to protest against the annexation, while a further Boer delegation had travelled to London to try and sue for independence from the British, but this again was unsuccessful despite the fact that Lord Carnarvon, by this point, had been replaced by Sir Michael Hicks Beach, who was less supportive of the idea of a South African confederation. In April 1880, the Liberal Party was voted into power by the British public, but hopes that the new government of Prime Minister W.E. Gladstone would be more sympathetic to the cause of Boer independence were rapidly shattered. The Volksrad of the Orange Free State, south of the Vaal River, backing the plight of the Transvaal Boers, in their calls for independence, and with diplomatic routes having quickly become diminished, an armed resistance was established to unseat the British occupation by force. The first action of the Anglo-Boer War came in November 1880, when P. Zell Bezuidenhout, a Boer citizen, refused to pay extra fees on his wagon, claiming he had already paid his taxes, thus leading to the confiscation of the wagon by the British authorities, the Boer resistance responding on November 11th when a contingent of 100 commandos, under the command of P. A. Koerner, stole the wagon back from the British bailiff and returned it to Bezuidenhout. Following this symbolic act of defiance, between 8,000 and 10,000 Boers gathered in Pardekral, near Krugersdorp, on December 8th, leading to the establishment of a triumvirate leadership for the Boer resistance, comprising Paul Kruger, Piet Hubert, and M. W. Pretorius, this being followed five days later by a proclaimed restoration of the Transvaal Republic, and the raising of the vehicle in Heidelberg, thus rejecting British authority. With diplomatic routes to resolve the escalating conflict having failed, the British now faced an armed uprising from a superior number of Boers, with the first shots fired being at Potschestrum, when 7,000 Boer citizens, together with some free staters, joined the commandos in their struggle to unseat the British, whose armed faction comprised, at most, 1,800 soldiers stationed in towns across the Transvaal. The sheer magnitude of the Boer force caught the British napping, with the colonial government having severely underestimated the strength and organisation of an enemy they considered to be merely a gathering of Dutch farmers, the Boers being in fact an extremely well-trained and disciplined unit that had long experience in combat when fighting for land against the local black tribes. The Boers knew the terrain well, were proficient in the use of firearms, and did not adopt a formal uniform, thus meaning they could easily blend in among the civilian population, while the redcoats of the British army were easy targets. This was demonstrated to devastating effect during the Battle of Lang's Neck in January 1881, 
when the British Natal Field Force, commanded by Major General Sir George Pomeroy Colley, and comprising around 1,200 officers and men, were routed in terrible fashion by the 2,000-strong Boer Army of Commandant General Hubert, who had fortified the heights around Lang's Neck and thus could easily repulse the British soldiers. In wave after wave, Colley attempted to force his way through the pass with every weapon at his disposal, including seven and nine-pounder guns, mounted cavalry, and a charge by the 58th Infantry Regiment, all of which were fruitless in dislodging the Boers from their entrenched position, and thus led to heavy British casualties during the hour-long skirmish. In the wake of the defeat at Lang's Neck, Colley was forced to await reinforcements, while Sir Evelyn Wood, a veteran of the Anglo-Zulu War, was appointed as his second-in-command, and brought with him additional soldiers from Newcastle, Colley agreeing to negotiate a settlement on February 16th, and would be open to a ceasefire on the condition that the Boers gave up their hopes of requiring independence of the Transvaal. As independence was the very foundation of the Boer campaign, this was an unacceptable proposal, and with negotiations having broken down, Colley opted to march against the Boer outpost of Majuba with 554 men on February 26th, while on the same day, General Piet Hubert and the Boer forces took up a position at Lang's Neck to check on the arrival of the British reinforcements. Colley's men reached the top of the mountain in the early hours of the morning, and were thus exhausted from their ascent, while Hubert, with a fresh contingent of Boer fighters, moved against the British at their position, using guerrilla tactics to pick off the superior enemy force. The British, fully exposed to Hubert's fighters, eventually being put into retreat after Collie was shot down in the field, casualties for the British being 200 killed against only two Boer commandos. However, the humiliating defeat at Majuba was one completely unnecessary, as even before the battle had taken place, negotiations were in motion to bring about peace in the Transvaal, as brokered by President Brand of the neighbouring Orange Free State, March 5, 1881, seeing Sir Evelyn Wood and Piet Hubert agree on an armistice in order to start peace negotiations at O'Neill's cottage, which lay between the British and Boer lines. These negotiations were ultimately successful, and the First Anglo-Boer War ended on March 23, 1881, after only three months of fighting, a British Royal Commission being appointed to draw up the Transvaal status and new borders, which would be confirmed and formalised at the Pretoria Convention on August 3, 1881 with Prime Minister Gladstone abandoning the previous government's federation policy and thus granting the Transvaal complete self-government, subject to the suzerainty of the British monarch. The new state was formally named the Transvaal and would comprise an independent republic, but still had to have its foreign relations and policies regarding black people approved by the British government, while any proposals to expand the country towards the west would be restricted. The Boer Triumvirate, though concerned by the presence of British suzerainty, ultimately taking their place as rulers of the Transvaal on August 10th. The Pretoria Convention was followed in 1884 by the signing of the London Convention, which gave the Transvaal a new western border and renamed the country to the South African Republic or SAR, though the British government still maintained its suzerainty over the SAR, and thus the Boer administration required their permission to enter into any treaties brokered with other countries beyond the neighbouring Orange Free State. This, however, would continue to stir seething resentment against the British by the Boer population, who saw it as a way for the UK government to interfere in Transvaal affairs, while for the British, the defeat of their forces by the Boer fighters was seen by many in the military establishment as a fluke, and that there should be vengeance enacted against the Boers by way of a new campaign to completely overthrow the Transvaal. These tensions would build over the following decade with the two Boer republics of the Orange Free State and the South African Republic continuing to maintain their desire for independence, while also providing an awkward stumbling block for British aspirations to expand their influence further across South Africa. The desire for expansion was further stoked by the discovery of gold on the Witwatersrand in the Transvaal during 1886, as while gold had been mined in South Africa since the early 1870s, this newly found deposit far outstripped anything that had been uncovered before, and nearly overnight turned the Transvaal from an economically bereft state into one of the world's biggest gold producers, with thousands of white and black South Africans being employed in the mining industry by 1890. 
With the Boer republics now being among the richest nations in Africa, these two states could rapidly finance their independence movements, while at the same time holding a significant amount of leverage over the supply of global gold shipments to fuel the international monetary system, much to the chagrin of the British, who at this time were the centre of industry and trade on the world stage and needed a steady supply of gold to maintain this position. The colonial government in the British Cape Colony, which had now been displaced by the Boer Republic as the richest and most economically influential state in South Africa, was under severe pressure, primarily from individual gold miners who were being squeezed out of the market by large-scale Boer mining companies due to the difficulty in excavating the gold supplies within the Transvaal. Gold deposits in the Transvaal were buried deep underground and thus difficult to reach, requiring the sinking of shafts similar to those methods employed by coal mines, which was a resource-heavy process that far outstripped the capabilities of individual miners, while mining companies, backed largely by the Boer government, could collect the experience of local and international investment as well as expertise to essentially monopolize the gold mining industry and market for South Africa. With prospectors hoping to make their fortune streaming into the country, the Boer government dubbed this immigrant population as Outlanders, the sheer influx of these foreigners into the nation threatening its independence, and thus required legislative action by the state in order to curb their potential political influence, including restricted voting rights for Outlanders, who had been in the Transvaal for less than 14 years. Making the volatile situation even worse were the vast array of political leaders in South Africa, of whom many had strongly opposing views, with Paul Kruger remaining as president of the Transvaal, while Cecil John Rhodes became premier of the Cape Colony in 1890, Rhodes having made his fortune through the mining of diamonds in South Africa, and was a major proponent of a united South Africa under British rule, this being countered by the pro-independence Kruger. Rhodes was strongly of the conviction that, should the Transvaal and Orange Free State be allowed to continue their economic prosperity thanks to their newfound gold mining wealth, the potential existed that the South African Republic could exceed and ultimately be able to topple British rule in the region, his overarching priority being the continued restrictions on the Republic's westward expansion towards the Atlantic, thereby cutting off the landlocked nation from international trade on its own terms. By 1895, the British government had decided that the only way to bring the SAR into line would be through political and military pressure, with Rhodes, in collusion with Colonial Secretary Joseph Chamberlain, developing a plan to promote the British Empire in South Africa. In September and October of that year, the drift crisis between the Cape Colony and the Transvaal took place following the completion of a railway line to Johannesburg, with the railway operator intending to usurp as much traffic as possible coming out of the Transvaal prior to the opening of the SAR's own Delagoa Bay line through the provision of reduced shipment rates on the British-controlled line for mining operators. In response, the Boer government, in an attempt to dissuade this shift onto the British-controlled railway, increased the rates on the part of the line that ran through the Transvaal once it had crossed the Vaal River, leading to a fragmented shipment method whereby goods was transported by train as far as the Vaal River and then transferred for the rest of its journey by horse-drawn wagon in order to avoid paying the higher prices in the Transvaal. This ultimately led Kruger to block access to the Transvaal, closing the drifts on the Transvaal side, with the British government demanding that Kruger reopen the drifts and use the situation to involve itself directly in Transvaal affairs, Rhodes hoping to destabilize the Boer government by way of orchestrating an uprising among the disenfranchised Outlanders in Johannesburg, which would coincide with an invasion of the Transvaal from Bukanaland, what is now Botswana, by Dr. Leander Starr Jameson. The goal of Rhodes' campaign was to overthrow the Boer government of the Transvaal and turn it into a British colony that would join all the other colonies in a federation, with Chamberlain acting as an intermediary between Rhodes and Dr. Jameson, as the latter prepared his invasion of the South African Republic. The Jameson raid subsequently took place on December 29, 1895, but ended in total failure for the invasion force, the Outlander leaders in Johannesburg not being able to come to a unanimous decision regarding what kind of government should be established after the overthrow of the Boers, while others had no interest in a violent uprising and preferred instead to celebrate the new year, with Rhodes being informed that the Outlanders had opted to abandon the proposed raid. However, Rhodes was too late in stopping Jameson, 
who had already led his troops across the border into the Transvaal. Jameson's troops attempting to cut communication lines to Pretoria, but ended up cutting the wrong lines, thus meaning the Transvaal government were fully aware of the intruders in their land, and thus were able to ambush and capture them at Dornkop near Krugersdorp on January 2, 1896. In the wake of the Jameson raid, the prisoners were handed over to their own government, while the Uitlander leaders who had been part of the plot were put on trial in Johannesburg, with sentences of death being handed out to several figures in the Uitlander rebellion, but these were all later reduced to large fines. The Jameson raid, however, would have far-reaching consequences, and fully proved the malicious intent of the colonial government in the Cape Colony when it came to attempting an overthrow of the Transvaal administration, a humiliated Rhodes being forced to resign as Premier, while relations between the Dutch-descended Afrikaans and English-speaking colonists deteriorated to the point of near-open hostility. In the Transvaal itself, the Orange Free State, as a sign of solidarity against the British, cooperated more closely with the Boer government in Pretoria, while suspicion and frustration among the people of the Transvaal as to this invasion of their territory, and the collusion of the Uitlanders in Jameson's terrible folly, meant this segment of the population suffered fierce reprisals and a loss of further rights when compared to the Boers. With Rhodes forced out of office, and the Uitlanders having seen their rights reduced further in the Transvaal, Chamberlain opted to try and salvage his political career through the invitation of Kruger to London for talks about the Uitlanders' lack of voting rights, though Kruger showed no interest in discussing the topic of the SAR's internal affairs, as he did not want to give the impression that his government could not handle its own policies independently. Regardless, Chamberlain continued to demand that Britain take further involvement in the internal affairs of the Transvaal, thus leading to ever-increasing tension between the two countries. The flames of discontent stoked by the dispatch of Sir Alfred Milner, another loyal supporter of British expansion, to the Cape Colony as British High Commissioner, where he would work to try and smear the election campaign of Kruger in the upcoming general elections in the Transvaal. Milner had hoped that Kruger would not be re-elected, and thus replaced by a political leader more inclined to British control, though ultimately, in 1898, Kruger was voted back into office as President of the South African Republic. Milner, panicked by the nationalist support Kruger was receiving, stating in no uncertain terms to Chamberlain that military action against the Boers was the only possible way to prevent a complete takeover of South Africa by the Afrikaans. In December 1898, Transvaal police shot Tom Edgar, an Uitlander who had been killed in what was claimed by the officer to be self-defense, though the Uitlander community took this as a political incident thus further alienating the Boers from the British subjects in the Transvaal, and giving the perfect excuse for the British forces to commence military action against the Republic on the grounds of protecting their citizens in the country. On October 9, 1899, amid the continued rise in tensions between the two factions, the Boer government issued an ultimatum to Britain, followed two days later by a formal declaration of war between Britain and the Transvaal. The UK government once again considering that the matter of defeating Kruger and his forces would be an easy task, but had failed to grasp that now both the Transvaal and the Orange Free State would be fighting on grounds they knew far better than the British. The opening action took place at Talana near Dundee in northern Natal on October 29, 1899, leading to an indecisive outcome as both generals divided their forces, followed a day later by a second battle at Elans Lager at which point the British secured a major victory due to their superior numbers, October 30th also seeing other actions between the two sides, with the Boers seeing triumph at Muddersprut and Nicholson's Neck. This forced the British into a defensive position, and their strongholds of Ladysmith, Kimberley and Mafeking were besieged by the Boer commandos, the British army being divided into three main groups under General Sir Redvers Buller, who was the British commander-in-chief in South Africa at the beginning of the war, Lieutenant General Lord Methan and Lieutenant General W. F. Gaitaker, who controlled forces in the Cape Colony. In December 1899, what was dubbed the Black Week by the British military command took place when the colonial army suffered heavy casualties in three different significant battles, fought at Stormberg, Magus Fontaine and Colenso, Fuller's series of defeats at the hands of the Boers, leading to his replacement by Major General Lord Kitchener though he retained his position of commander of the military forces in the Natal colony. 
going into January 1900, the British continued to see loss after loss, with the battles of Spoinkop on January 24th and Valkrans on February 7th, both seeing the Boers secure decisive victories that rapidly illustrated how ill-equipped the British army was when tasked with facing a strong guerrilla campaign. In the aftermath of the Black Week, reinforcements from Britain were dispatched to the Cape Colony, arriving on January 10th in Cape Town with Major General Lord Kitchener and Lord Roberts, the new British tactic being to simply overwhelm the Boer commandos with sheer numbers, with attempts to ambush the colonial army barely denting the ranks of the newly landed troops. With reinforcements en route, the sieges in Kimberley and Ladysmith were ended during February 1900, while on March 13th, the British Army had occupied the Orange Free State capital of Bloemfontein, followed by Johannesburg on June 1st, Pretoria eventually being captured four days later with little struggle, and due to the sheer numbers of British soldiers, as well as the loss of the two capitals of the Boer republics, up to 13,900 rebels chose to lay down their arms and submit to the occupying force. However, hundreds continued to maintain a guerrilla war and would harass the British occupation at every opportunity throughout 1900 and into 1901, as supported by sympathetic Boer civilians. Lord Kitchener, commander of the British forces, choosing to cut off the supply of food to the Boers from March 1901 in order to break their spirit and essentially hold the population of the Transvaal hostage. A scorched earth policy was therefore adopted by the British army, with 30,000 Boer farmhouses and more than 40 towns being burned to the ground, while livestock that wasn't in the possession of the state, including horses, cattle and sheep, was slaughtered, with food supplies being strictly managed by the colonial government or Uitlanders placed into commanding positions. To further separate the guerrillas from the civilian population that supported them, Concentration camps were established in order to keep a firm control over non-combatants, with 40 camps, at its peak, being peppered across the country that housed 116,000 white women and children, while another 60 camps were created to house 115,000 black people. Conditions inside these camps were beyond appalling, with overcrowding, a lack of sufficient food and water, and the generally unsanitary state of the infrastructure, meaning diseases ran rampant compounded further by an ineffective supply of medicine, with measles, whooping cough, typhoid fever, diphtheria and dysentery, resulting in the deaths of every one in five children. In the end, the total death toll for the civilian population held captive in concentration camps were 26,370 white women and children, with 81% of the casualties being children, while at the same time more than 15,000 black people also died in their segregated camps. Though the Transvaal and Orange Free States had been fully occupied, the Boers continued their bloody guerrilla campaign through 1901 and into 1902, but due to the landlocked nature of the countries, combined with a lack of efficient transport routes across the scrub of southern Africa, the Boer commandos quickly found themselves losing men and equipment faster than they could replace them, and it was soon apparent that their limited numbers and dwindling support would not be enough to remove the British occupation. Now facing the possibility of total defeat, the Boer leadership ultimately entered into peace negotiations with the British from March 1902, with preliminary meetings taking place among Boer representatives from April 11th in Klerksdorp, as well as with Lord Kitchener in Pretoria, Milner attempting to prevent these talks, as he was insistent that any end to hostilities should be made in the form of complete Boer surrender. On May 15th, 1902, a meeting of 30 representatives from each side took place at Varinaging, followed at the end of the month by the signing of an official peace agreement at Melrose House in Pretoria, the main contents of this treaty being the allowing of Uitlanders to return to the Transvaal, an end to all Boer hostilities and the surrender of all their weapons, the allowance of Dutch to still be taught in schools and used in courts, and the establishment of a civil government to replace the military administration of the British. Furthermore, Self-government of the former Boer states would be promoted, while voting rights for black people would only be discussed once the two new colonies could govern themselves, financial help would be provided for poor citizens, and the debts of the two new colonies would be paid off, many Boers feeling that the cause for their rebellion should not be dispelled with so easily, but had not the resources to continue fighting, while the Transvaal and Orange Free State leaders opted not to divide the two former republics. Eventually, 
39,000 Uitlanders returned to the Transvaal and the mines opened again. The addition of these two new colonies into the arsenal of the British Empire being a major financial and political boost to the UK government, who could now control vast quantities of the global gold supply while injecting much of their new income into the arms race currently being undertaken against the Germans in the years leading up to World War I. Lord Carnarvon's Federation of South African States would eventually come about during 1910, when the Cape, Natal, Transvaal and Orange River colonies were combined into the Union of South Africa, which, like Canada, Australia and New Zealand, was a self-governing dominion of the British Empire, and would last through until 1961, at which point the country was officially declared a republic. In summary, the two Boer Wars of South Africa were a natural outcome of limited land and a desire to control the incredibly valuable resources of this vast nation, thus leading to a conflict that illustrated both the best and worst aspects of either side when it came to fighting within the Transvaal. The Boers proved themselves to be excellent guerrilla fighters with an exceptional knowledge of the land, easily capable of harassing and in many cases defeating a fully mobilised British army without having to engage in a costly pitched battle, though ultimately, the plight of the Boers and their considerable skills could not stand up to sheer firepower once British reinforcements had arrived, which, coupled to the imprisonment of large swathes of the Boer population, meant subjugation of the colony couldn't be avoided. 